getting started. So I, I have been asked to, to serve as the chair of the Rising Star Committee for this year's Sigmetrics. And uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce you on uh, Professor Zhenghua Niu, who is the Rising Star, this year's Rising Star Award recipient. And so for his fundamental contribution on managing complex distributed system and limited information and the network constraints. So before um, I let uh, Zhenghua to talk about give his talk, let me just uh, briefly talk, give you a little bit uh, short bio of, uh, for Zhenghua. So Zhenghua is currently a system professor at the uh, operational research in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Statistics at the Stony Brook, also called the Sony, Sony Brook. He received his PhD in computer science from Caltech, Caltech under the supervision of Adam, Adam Vilman and Stephen No. And his research is most interesting, the analytical models and theoretical results, looking at managing complex system and looking at the uh, system sustainability for IT and the IT for sustainability. So uh, Zhenghua has uh, received a, a number of uh, different awards before, for example, this Rising Star Award. But he has, for example, he's a recipient of NSF Career Award. And he also have uh, helped uh, HP, the Hewlett Packard Enterprise, to design their net zero data centers, which is a uh, one uh, 2013 computer world honor kind of laureate. And he also received a number of uh, best paper awards. And more recently, he also received an IBM 2020 Global University Program Academic Award. So, so there's many awards Zhenghua has received. So Zhenghua is going to give a talk on sustainable IT and IT for sustainability. So without much ado, um, uh, first of all, congr congratulations again. And without much ado, uh, the floor is all yours, um, uh, Zoom is all yours. OK, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, OK, so how much time do I have for the talk? Okay, <laughs> I guess we have a total of one hour. I will try to finish a little bit earlier. So we have some time for questions. Okay. Uh, can everyone see my slides? Yes, yes. By the way, for anyone uh, who have a question, uh, please feel free to either raise your hand or uh, type your question in the chat. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a, a relatively small uh, uh, audience. So right. if you have questions, I will try my best uh, to watch the chat box from time to time. Could, could you actually zoom out a little bit? Your screen seems uh, small, at least on, on my side. So, yeah, it's already full screen. Or maybe just my side. Don't, don't worry about it. Yeah. OK, let me try that again. Uh, I'm not sure any other people have the similar issues. Checkbox. It seems other people also say it's kind of small. Maybe you have a really huge screen. You may, uh, you may want to reduce the resolution of your screen. Let me do it now. Otherwise, it's probably fine, so don't worry too much about it. Is it better now or is it? Uh, the same. So, okay, don't worry about it. Just uh, we, we can get started. Okay, yes. Uh, actually, I, I can change to another computer if needed. No, don't worry about it. Let's get started. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so uh, I guess good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. <laughs> Especially for those people in Asia, I think it's a very late uh, uh, in the night. So thanks a lot for coming to my talk. So today I will 
uh, talk about my uh, research and uh, also uh, uh, try to uh, talk a little bit about the future directions uh, in the area of sustainable IT and uh, IT for sustainability. So before I start, so because I'm uh, actually actively looking for uh, new students, and uh, so I want to give a very quick uh, introduction of uh, Stony Brook and uh, also our department uh, of uh, applied math and statistics. So there are several big names in our university. One is probably many people know, especially in the computer architecture community. Uh, so he, uh, Professor John Anderson graduated actually with a master and a PhD degree from Stony Brook University. And uh, more with uh, on the math side, uh, we have Jim Simons, uh, who was the uh, department chair of the mathematics department. And uh, uh, his, I guess, in the research community is also famous for the Simon Center. This is the Simon Center at uh, Stony Brook for uh, theoretical physics and uh, uh, geometry. And of course, for uh, people working in physics, uh, Professor uh, Yang is a very famous uh, uh, physicist. And uh, uh, actually, he's, he still has an office at uh, Stony Brook University. Uh, it's actually on the sixth floor of the, the building I am in. I actually visited here several times. And uh, for our department uh, of uh, applied math department, so we actually have a uh, a uh, fairly good uh, reputation and ranking uh, in the nation. Uh, so if any student and, uh, want to come and uh, join us in different ways, uh, you are more than welcome to contact me. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, uh, sustainability. So why we care about sustainability? Uh, we probably use Google uh, service every day. It's, uh, uh, it's a very, helpful and uh, actually help shaping the world uh, we handle knowledge. Right? So currently Google is uh, we're doing a lot of uh, search every day. And, uh, but on the other side, all of those actually consume a lot of energy. And uh, uh, if the energy actually from the traditional uh, fossil cell, then there is a significant emission from uh, doing that. Together with all other uh, cloud computing services, right? like uh, today we also heard about a talk uh, from Dr. Uh, Hong about the great progress at Microsoft about uh, Azure, right? and also Amazon, they're also doing cloud. All of them together, right? uh, the emission of IT was comparable to the airline industry. Uh, so this is a significant part. So that's why, uh, when I started the research on system IT, uh, uh, I was partially motivated by the two piece of uh, uh, report published by Greenpeace. One is uh, how dirty is your data, the other is uh, how clean is your cloud. Right. So uh, arguably, I think cloud uh, climate change is actually one of the biggest challenging uh, challenges facing our uh, society. and. Uh, uh, especially for the uh, young generation. That's why during the past, uh, uh, I think one decade or even two, so in traditional network and system research, we see a new dimension that is energy and accessibility uh, emerge. Actually, you can see a lot of the uh, traditional research topics. Now people start to care about the energy, uh, uh, reliability, uh, so renewable energy, uh, and also the emission. Uh, actually, within ACM, uh, we, we are very happy to say uh, we have a new SIG, that is uh, uh, the SIG on the uh, e-energy uh, part. So uh, that also partially demonstrated the importance and the recognition of uh, energy-related uh, research, even within the traditional computer science study in ACM. So if we consider this can be generally divided into two parts. The first one is to make the IT system more sustainable. The second one is to use IT 
on the sensibility of our whole society. So my research was uh, moving along both direction. And uh, in this talk, I will uh, first talk about uh, how to uh, handle the emission of IT system itself. And then we will try to make a more impact by using IT uh, to improve the overall sustainability of our society. Okay, I start with this one. So uh, along this line, there has been a lot of engineering improvements uh, during the past uh, uh, two decades, right? from cooling, from power distribution, and uh, they are modelized data center, and they are also uh, pilot, put the uh, data center into the, the bay, uh, in the bay area, or put it into the Arctic area. We heard a lot of uh, uh, story in the news. So with all those efforts, uh, people are trying uh, at least partially to re improve the, uh, yeah, it's a little bit, because this metric is a bit uh, confusing because, okay, let me give you the definition. So the power usage effectiveness is calculated by uh, the power into the whole building divided by the power consumed by the IT system. So uh, because the, the denominator is uh, what we use to do the real work. Therefore, actually, we want the uh, metric to be as small as possible. Right? So that's why it's a little bit confusing because it's called effectiveness. So if you expect it to be larger, it's better, but actually here, lower is better. So with all the great effort, uh, just like a, a little bit more than 10 years ago, the P, uh, power usage effectiveness or PUE is still larger than three. But nowadays it's uh, below 1.1. Right? And uh, some data centers even claim is, uh, uh, can be below one because they can use the power of the heat generated to do some other work. Okay. But the question here is that a lower PUE does not necessarily mean we have a lower energy consumption, right? Because it's a ratio. Actually, uh, if we uh, play a trick, right, we, we move the cooling part onto the server instead of uh, using the infrastructure for cooling. We actually move some of the power consumption into the denominator, which can actually reduce the value. But clearly that doesn't change of the power uh, consumption of the data center, right? which is a, a more important problem because nowadays with all those GPU servers, it's, a, it's increasingly rely on the server themselves to do the cooling. Right? So uh, this is the first uh, part we want to pay attention to. The second one is that even lower energy consumption doesn't necessarily mean sustainability. Right? During the past decade, we see a lot great progress from the major IT companies to move from the traditional PUE metrics to more like the sustainability. And so here we start to see the companies build a large wind farms and a PV solar farm to actually generate the power to uh, power the data centers. So actually that one will help us on the sustainability side. Okay, so my research focuses on the ultimate goal to try to improve the sustainability, right? to make them more sustainable. So the data center here, I just have a very simple uh, figure to show. For example, this is just one example of the IT demand. Of course, uh, we see more and more complicated figures, but the message are the same. So we have the IT demand is dynamic over time. We also have other overhead. On the power generation side, we will have some local renewable generation. For example, this is a solar, and uh, I think this is from Palo Alto. So you can see it's a uh, very regular and sunny uh, during summer. Uh, the grid price uh, is also have a, a strong weekly and uh, diurnal pattern. So the goal, of course, is to match the demand and the supply. 
but both are dynamic and uncertain. Especially on the IT demand side, now uh, I think quite some report uh, claim the IT demand is becoming less predictable. And for the generation side, renewable generation is still, despite all great efforts, is still not very easy to predict. And even the great price with more renewable integration level is start to factor it more. Right? So all of those create challenges for the uncertainty. Right? So this is a one case study, right? The power may look like this. Uh, the bar chart is a power and the red curve is a solar generation. Right? So, but we actually, uh, Want to uh, want the demand to be uh, matched with the renewable generation as much as possible. Right. So by doing workload management. So what makes this possible is workload is actually flexible. Right. The flexibility uh, from at least uh, two parts. One is temporal. Right. We can move some of the uh, workload uh, to from. Uh, to run them at a different time. Right? So traditional, we have a lot of uh, batch jobs. For example, in Google, uh, we have the, uh, the backup. We also have the indexing. A lot of work can be done uh, with some time flexibility. So we have the batch jobs, so we can reschedule them. Even for now, for machine learning and deep learning nowadays, uh, we have the uh, training part normally we have uh, some time flexibility in scheduling those training jobs. And uh, for the uh, inference jobs, those are often real time, right? So it's a, a similar story. So basically we have a uh, both flexible and a non-flex job and uh, in time. So we can do this uh, temporal management by doing demand shipping. The other part is a spatial, which I think is very unique in, for data centers and uh, more general for cloud computing. Cloud computing, I think, benefit uh, uh, a lot from the paradigm shift during the past year, the pandemic, with a lot of people start to have a flexibility in where they work. And so, we, of course, the pandemic has a lot of uh, bad consequences, but uh, it also demonstrated the uh, flexibility in cloud computing. Right. So we will talk about how to utilize the spatial uh, flexibility in the cloud, uh, for example, to do the geographical load balancing to follow the renewable. Okay, so we will. By the way, any questions here? I do not see any question yet. Okay. No, I so, so I could have a question. So here you mostly target on data center type of environment, right? So when you talk about workload is flexible. Yes. Okay. Yes. This can be a single data center or a network of data centers. Okay. Okay, so for the geography load balancing of call it GLB, right? So this is a, a simple uh, diagram. So we have data centers, uh, at different location. And uh, uh, so this is partly because we want to minimize network delay. I think that's a main goal. And also we want to increase reliability. Uh, but this makes the routing more challenging. I right, to see this. So the user request will first go to a proxy or mapping node. And then this one will decide which data center send the traffic to. Right, Sometimes it's easy just to send the nearby data center but sometimes it's a little bit more challenging, right? We need to decide which one to send, right? So we call it the energy aware routing because we want to make the trade-off between load balancing, network latency, and also the energy. So all of this, again, is temporary and location dependent. So for each data center, once we receive the, uh, the incoming load, right, we can do the dynamic capacity provisioning and to uh, decide the number of active servers or the capacity allocated to a particular service or uh, to a set of services. So we call the whole system 
has a geographical node bias. So I have a demo here. Uh, so as we can see here for each data center, uh, there is a cycle. Like this one. So we have both demand part, left hand side the demand part, right hand side the supply part. As we can say, as time goes, uh, each point of the source will send the traffic to the different data center, right? Depending on the uh, renewable generation. So we can, yeah, so this is a, a demonstration of uh, how the system works. Okay, so to realize such a system. So we need a deployable and a distributed control. And also with theoretical guarantees to do this kind of a follow the renewable routing. As we can see from the previous uh, slides, so the goal here is to send more traffic to the data center uh, where we have more renewable generation. Right? By doing this, we can improve the sustainability of the overall system. So, my approach is go from analytical modeling and then to algorithm design and to evaluate impact and finally go to the system implementation. And uh, throughout this one, uh, I strive for both rigor and uh, relevance in this research. So let's start with the first one, the modeling part. So I just present a very simple model. Uh, but of course, since our work uh, back uh, in 10 years ago, so a lot of great uh, follow-up research make it uh, the model become more uh, realistic than more complicated. But here, uh, just for presentation simplicity, uh, I still use a simple model here. So for the workload, for example, I show a two-day workload, we will discretize the workload into a time slot. And for each time slot, we have the mean request rate that is denoted by LJ. Uh, we will have, we also do some online with design and I will talk a little bit about that later uh, to handle the uh, changing in the amount of different slots. So, so far let's, uh, for now, let's focus on just one time slot. Okay, given the mean request rate to a source node, then it will need to decide the mean rate, average rate, to go from this source node J to the data center I. Here we denote it as lambda IJ. So this is the energy aware routing. So for the data center, after we receive the traffic, we have some configuration that is total number of servers, which is MI. This can also be the total uh, capacity allocated to this service. We have the local energy price of this time slot. We have the power usage effectiveness denoted as EI, and we have a local renewable generation, which is RI. So the arrival rate is lambda I. Then it needs to decide the number of active servers, uh, which is small MI. Right? This is a dynamic capacity provision. So by doing this, the goal is to try to minimize a combination of energy costs and uh, uh, delay costs. Uh, so this is, again, this is a simple model. And uh, of course, uh, yeah, actually in our own later work, we make it uh, more uh, complicated. Uh, but I think for the presentation purpose here, uh, please bear <laughs> with me for this simplified model. Right. The model is actually have two parts. One is the energy cost. We denote it as GI. The energy cost is mainly related to the number of active servers you keep on, which is a small MI. Of course, it's related to other parameters uh, like uh, electricity price, renewable generation, and uh, the, the data center efficiency. On the delay side, we have the uh, two parts. One is the, uh, okay. So the first part here is the, processing delay within the data center. The second part is uh, the DIJ is a network latency. Right? So at a high level, 
uh, three part. One is a cost within the data center. Second one is a delay uh, to process the workload in the data center. The third part is network latency. Right. We are minimizing over small MI, which is a dynamic capacity provisioning. We are also doing the routing part, the energy aware routing. So those are the constant, those are fairly uh, straightforward. The first one, you, you want to allocate all the workload capacity constraint and for the queuing system to be stable. We don't want to overload it. So the first observation we have is that this is actually a convex optimization problem. Therefore, a centralized algorithm will serve the purpose to solve it. The challenge is how to make it a, a distributed algorithm, right? especially for the internet scale systems like uh, uh, the cloud computing. Given the scale, it's, uh, many, there are a lot of benefit to develop distributed algorithm. Okay, now we move to the algorithm part. Yeah, just uh, interrupt me if you have any questions, otherwise I will continue. So algorithm part, we mainly talk about two parts. One is to make it distributed, the other to handle information uncertainty. Before our work, there are a lot of other uh, research on distributed algorithm design for geographic load balancing. And also some of them are uh, applied into the real system. Uh, when we did the research, none of them actually give the guarantee of the optimality for the system I just described. Therefore, we work on this part. So the basic idea is that uh, for each data center, you given the workload, uh, you can actually do a local optimization to solve the uh, dynamic capacity provision problem by yourself. And this part is fun. And this information will uh, be shared in the system. And then the each proxy can update the routing uh, decision based on the uh, capacity of each data center. And then this matrix, uh, the traffic will be better at each data center. Uh, and then they can continue to do that uh, eventually, hopefully, we can convert to the optimal solution. Uh, that's a basic uh, uh, idea. And uh, by separating this into these two parts, there is actually no performance loss in terms of the optimality. OK, now we work on the challenging part because the proxy need to make the decision independently. But it's actually we have uh, the, the decision have a joint impact on each data center. Consider a uh, proxy J, and this is a feasible set for uh, it's a routing decision, right? which is defined as is, uh, you need to send all the traffic and non-active. And the last one is important. That means it's own decision uh, to send the traffic to a data center I, plus the traffic sent from all other proxies together need to be within the capacity of that data center. Right. So you can imagine the challenge is that when one data center become very popular, for example, with a lot of renewable generation, right, uh, all the, a, lot, all, a lot of the proxies will want to send the traffic to that, to that data center. Right. This may cause congestion and uh, actually the queuing in within the data center. Right. So if we move very aggressively, it's not good. Right. So that's why what we do is we want to coordinate them. Right. So the basic idea is that from the current state, right, we will find the, uh, the direction, the negative gradient direction. And this is where we can, uh, the, the objective function, uh, the cost will decrease. Right. So traditional method is to do the projection back. But here, the challenge is that the objective function, especially due to the queuing delay, is not uh, smooth enough. Uh, in particular, it's not Lipschitz. So the traditional, if you directly apply the traditional proof, it doesn't work. The second one is we want to make it distributed, uh, but the constraint are coupled, as I just explained. So our idea is that we start with a feasible initial point, which is uh, very easy to get because you can imagine 
and most of the time of the from the system is actually a feasible set. Right? And then from that part, we can define a level set. Right? And then when we do the projection, we will project back to this level set, and this level set contains all the optimum points. And when we do the gradient projection, if you directly go to that point, as I just explained, many other people may do the same at the same time. This will cause uh, congestion. So therefore, what we do, we scale back. Right? Okay, this is the first one. We scale it back, right? So that we can prove by doing this is always uh, will decrease. Right? More formally, this is the result. Right? So assuming the step size is small enough, which is a common assumption, uh, not assumption, it's a common requirement for distributed algorithm. Uh, the every living point is optimal. Right? And the step size is uh, on the order of uh, one divided number of proxies. Right? Because when you have more proxies, you want to be more conservative because you know there are many other proxies may do the same as you are. And uh, if there are higher load, we will making smaller steps right? because we are close to the area which we may overload some data centers. And another remaining challenge, as I just promised, is that we not only handle one time slot, right? But actually, uh, as time goes, we have more time slot and we also have the workload, the recovery generation. All this situation will change over time. Right? So we need to handle the online resource provisioning as well. Right? The goal is again to minimize the cost, but we have the performance guarantee and capacity limits. Right? The challenge here we focus on, in addition to the distributed algorithm design, is the decision for the provisioning is coupled in time. Right? For example, we don't want to turn on and off server very often. Right? Even for the current, uh, for example, container-based cloud computing, right? we still don't want to create or destroy the container very often. There is a significant cost associated with that. On the other hand, the demand uh, prediction may come with high error, right? Especially we may see some nonsense stationarity in the workload. Right? We study the workload of both Google trees and Microsoft Azure trees. Right? For some of the uh, servers or virtual machine, we can observe very significant uh, change point uh, or the paradigm shift in the workload. Right? So all of those create challenges for resource management. Right? Okay, so for our recent research, so the goal is that with all those great algorithms developed both for prediction and the control side. Right? So we want to jointly pick the right combination right? over time right? to try to match the optimal solution. Right? So how we did it? Right? So we first uh, incorporate the prediction error into explicitly into the dynamic regret analysis. And then we design a meta algorithm right, to choose the combination over time. Due to the time limit, I, I won't be able to uh, talking into the details, but uh, at least I can show you the result we get. So this dash line is an offline optimal solution. Oh, sorry, this is an offline slide. Is a, let me make it clear. This dash line is an optimal solution, right? This is normalized as one. So this line is the offline slide, means that after the uh, decision period, right? you look back and then use all the information you have, but you can, uh, think is, this is a static, right? This, then you just pick the, uh, the best combination you can have. Right? So this is uh, the performance, it's very close to the optimal solution. But if you use some traditional method like the weighted majority, uh, so the cost is much higher. Right? Using our method, to dynamically choose uh, the combination. And so we can almost mimic this one. 
So this is just a one reason why allow uh, the line of packeting information uncertainty. Right. More recently, we have another work uh, about the online peak aware energy scheduling with untrusted advice with my student and uh, uh, actually it's led by uh, folks from UMass and uh, it's a collaborative work also with a, a faculty member from the Hampton. So this one, we will, a student will present the, uh, this paper actually very soon in energy 2021. So if you are interested in that one, uh, you are more than welcome to go to that talk to, to learn more uh, details about that work. Okay, now we briefly talk about the algorithm design, both for the distributed algorithm design, still return uh, optimality, and also the online algorithm design, try to uh, make uh, good prediction or good decisions despite the information uncertainty. Right. With this, now we study the impact that is both for the data center operators in terms of the monetary cost. Right. We show mm -hmm. that uh, we can save the cost significantly. But the problem is that by saving the cost, we actually increase the energy consumption, the total energy consumption. Uh, because when the, uh, the trade-off between the service capacity and the, the quality of service, right? when the costs become more, become cheaper, actually you can use more to benefit your, your performance. So this may not be very good for the environment, but if we uh, not just going into the data center with cheaper but dirty uh, energy generation, but if we go to the where we have more renewable generation, like what we showed previously, then we can also reduce the emission a lot. So, so the key message here is that with the distributed and online algorithms, we can reduce energy costs, which is good news for data center operators. And uh, it also is the renewable integration if we do the follow the renewable routing. And finally, for the uh, imputation part, the imputation actually is two part. One is for the proxy and YP node to the routing part. This has already been implemented uh, in the industry. Right? For example, Google has a global workload management system to do that. So this is that. The data center to do the dynamic capacity provisioning, this was not very easy at that time. So that's why I go to collaborate with, Google, with HP uh, to uh, do the sustainable data center design. Right? There we have a, a data center, we have three parts, IT demand, the cooling, and the power supply. We gather all the information and to make the decision and uh, to minimize environmental impact, energy costs, while still meeting the service level agreements. Right? So structure-wise, we take all kinds of predictions and uh, act no factors, SLA and other goals to generate this one to the runtime workload manager. Right. And then of course, within that, we have both model and control as we described. Right. This can be both local and global. For the runtime workload manager, it also supports co-location of different type of workload, the live migration uh, of the virtual machine uh, if needed, and the cooling optimization and the reactive control. So this is a very simple demonstration. I, and some of you may already see that, but this is a very quick one. And show this. Okay, so the, you can know the lower part. The upper part, we show three physical servers. And uh, on the server, there are a lot of virtual machine. And then this part is a power supply. You can see we can use the PV solar generation or we use a power grid. During the noon time, now we have a lot of renewable generation. So we run a lot of the uh, batch shops. And at this time, we can use the chiller cooling because the temperature is high. And later, when we move to uh, the evening, we don't have enough renewable generation. We go back to rely on the power grid. And we don't run a lot of uh, uh, batch jobs to save energy. At this time, the cooling efficiency actually is much higher because outside temperature actually goes down. This is a simple demonstration. So this at that time is a HP 
review this one and uh, they get uh, the award. And more importantly, uh, they have a product called EcoPod data center uh, used by other IT companies. Okay, so now we close uh, uh, the loop of this one. Uh, and uh, let me quickly comment what happened, right? Basically after uh, almost 10 years of that. Right? So the good news is that now the data center efficiency has improved a lot. Uh, all the, from the server level, chip level, and uh, the infrastructure level, cooling, power distribution, all of them has been improved significantly. And the awareness of the energy problem, I think it has been widely accepted, which is a much better environment than 10 years ago. And also the renewable integration, as we can say, globally and uh, locally, a lot of uh, renewable integration, especially from solar and, from, and the wind. And those are all great news. On the other side, right? So with all those efforts, I think the, uh, the data center energy consumption is still growing. Right? I think recently uh, it's also partially driven by the accelerators like a GPU. A GPU is very power hungry. And now we are starting to build those uh, single server with four or even eight power hungry GPUs. Right? So for those servers, the traditional air cooling is not efficient enough. Right? They need to use the water cooling or oil cooling for those servers. Right? So you can imagine the power consumption of those servers. Right? So this is a one part uh, that is uh, uh, actually worth some notation. The other one is we have new IT energy hubs, right? Like the deep learning. Right? And also uh, nowadays on news, a lot of uh, critics about uh, the cryptocurrency mining. Right? And especially if the cryptocurrency price like Bitcoin, sorry, Bitcoin keep increasing, then uh, there will be more incentive actually to put a lot of uh, valuable chips just doing the proof of work to do the mining. Right? So that part is also definitely worth our attention. Right? That's one area of going. So basically this is a, a very good example of the Javan's paradox, paradox right? which says when we move one part of the, uh, uh, one type of the system more efficient, actually we will have more incentive or tendency to use it more, right? So the net effect, whether the total cost or the, in our case, is the energy consumption or emission, it's not necessarily decreasing. Right? That's something we want to pay attention to. But of course, right, cloud computing is a revolutionized our world. So there are a lot of uh, benefits uh, it brings. But uh, this talk we just want to say, we can probably do even better, right? make it uh, more environmental friendly. Okay, now we've finished the first half, or more than half actually. Uh, any questions? I do not see any questions yet. No yeah, let's continue. Maybe we can discuss in the end. Okay, now we talk about the uh, use IT for the uh, whole society. Right? The motivation was that, uh, yeah, I recall that uh, when I was a, a graduate student. So I was first very excited about the sustainable IT because this part is consume a, a really uh, huge amount of energy and billions of dollars per year. Right? And then until one day, <laughs> I realized that the whole IT uh, energy consumption is only 2% of the total energy consumption. Right? Okay, yes, of course, it's very important to tackle the 2% of the energy consumption, which of course is also uh, growing very fast. But on the other side, right, we have the remaining 98% right, of the society that I think the IT is better nowadays, right? We have AI machine learning, we have data science, uh, we can actually do a better job and uh, have a large impact for the whole sustainability of our society. That's the motivation of this part. And this is a figure we can see the increase 
a renewable generation right, from different sources. Of course, the hydropower, right, this keep increasing. And uh, even though we, the news keep talking about the wind and solar, pay attention to this hydropower. That is uh, probably one of the largest and it's increasing also fast. Right? Of course, solar and wind, especially solar, is kind of a, an exponential increase at this stage. And it's definitely outpaced other renewable sources. Right? So in the future, I think we can expect wind and solar continue growth. Uh, in the United States, many uh, states actually has their very aggressive goal, I think, for a renewable integration. And globally, many countries are also making commitment to reduce their emission or even neutralize the emission. Right. So those are all great news. So the, the challenge part on the other side is that for the power grid, right? Because our power grid was not designed for a high level of renewable integration. Right? That's in why the traditional we had the power grid try to match the generation with the supply. Right? So uh, in the old days, the demand is quite predictable. I, I saw one report saying that the utility company in the old days, they can predict uh, our demand uh, with only 2% of uh, uh, prediction error. Right? That's in old days. But now imagine a household with on roof PV panels and also a Tesla car, right? With that, I think it's very hard to predict at that accuracy. Right? And on the supply side, we have the wind and solar generation. Those are, uh, in the old days, they don't have those. Therefore, it's controllable and have a low certainty, but now it's not, right? That's why in the old days, we can uh, control the generation to follow the demand, which is very well predicted. But now, as I said, just describe with all of them. So uh, it's no longer very easy to do that, right? And uh, an alternative solution is to use energy storage right, to balance the supply and the demand, but it's very expensive and not very environmental friendly. Right? So that's why people start to kind of say, if we can make the demand to follow the generation, at least to some extent, that will be great for the uh, society and environment as a whole. Okay, so there are a lot of uh, sources for demand response, but in my mind, I think data centers, uh, uh, they are a promising option, right? Because they are very large load and they are highly automated, right? They can respond very fast. Mm -hmm. And they are also increasing very fast. Right? So with a uh, significant experience, we just described. Uh, so within data center, right, we have different level of flexibility, like from cooling and lighting, from workload management, and uh, data center also are equipped with a uh, on-site backup generator and uh, energy storage. Right? So all of those can be called upon uh, some events to help us stabilize the grid, which is very important because otherwise we may have blackout. So we uh, actually studied the uh, potential of data center demand response. And this one, we studied the voltage violation. So what we do is that we study that to reduce the same voltage violation rate, we can either use a data center with 20% of flexibility, or we can use energy storage. So as we can see, the, in terms of reduce the voltage violation, Data center is fairly efficient, and this has the potential to save us quite a lot of money and uh, the cost to build those energy storage. So for data center to, for, to realize this great potential, right? so there are a lot of programs, but the reality is that they rarely participate. Right? So the challenges here are a bit of here, two parts. Why is the algorithm design? Right? Because there are a lot of uncertainty uh, in those programs. Right? How to motivate data centers to participate is challenging. The other one is also the utility company, they need to have a good market design. Right? So to, for customer to, to get involved. Right? So we're working with different companies on this part. 
This is a joint uh, interdisciplinary challenge for both engineering and economics. Okay, here I just quickly describe two uh, recent work we did uh, to push this area forward. One is to use geographical load balancing to help with uh, frequency control. So in the power system, if you are more like a local, uh, then you more worry about your voltage, right? Because if you don't have enough generation, your voltage is low, versus otherwise it's high. But for the uh, more like a wide area, uh, for example, at a state level, the challenge is to maintain the frequency within a very small range. Right? Because data center, uh, the geographic load balancing, especially across the whole nation or even the world. Right? So when we move the workload around, we can actually help to stabilize even the frequency. Right? So our approach, we develop distributed control loads and we prove its both stability and optimality. And we also show that uh, in our simulation using the power uh, system tools, our proposed uh, algorithm can stabilize the frequency within also a very short range, small range uh, of the nominal one, but with a reduced cost, right? which is very close to the optimal cost. So this is uh, another potential for data center to contribute to the whole power system. And uh, the other one, as I mentioned, uh, demand response, another challenge is an incentive to participate. Here we can consider uh, the DR program actually have different levels of commitment, right? On one extreme, right? The customer is uh, responsible for all the changes, right? It's kind of a mandatory demand response. Once you sign the contract, whenever they call you to change, you need to change, right? Of course, this is not very good for customer because of the, all the standards that we have. On the other extreme, right? We can do some voluntary demand response, right? But in this case, even though customer want to sign up for those ones, they are not very useful for the power system because it's only voluntary, it's non binding right? So what do we develop, propose, Okay, this is just showing the challenge, right? For the household, you see the demand is uh, uh, not very regular, right? It's very challenging to do the mandatory cost. Right? So our approach is to incorporate the customer incentives into the mechanical design. Right? We have both the distributed algorithm for the utility company uh, to work with the customers. And we also can vary the level of commitment, right? to reduce the uh, optimize for the social cost. Right. If you're interested, you can refer to our paper for more details. Right. So throughout our goal is to uh, go from the model to algorithm to impact and uh, eventually for the system. Right. We start from the single data center, which is a building block for the internet scale system and our cloud computing. Right. This is geographical load balancing. And uh, it also benefited the whole society through demand response. So uh, within the data center, right? Nowadays, we know this is a platform for big data, deep learning, and uh, uh, um, machine learning, right? All of this, we also need to have a, a new methodology, new method, new algorithm to handle the uh, work within the data center. And uh, the data center can also help with the uh, uh, power system. Right? So later I will quickly uh, describe one uh, example of our recent research. Right. So moving forward, right? so clearly even also from this year's metrics, we can say uh, the keynotes and uh, all the great talks, uh, quite a few of them talk about the AI and machine learning system. Right? So actually this part is the uh, the chips, even though they are more efficient, it's also consume a lot of uh, electricity. So we want to make the AI machine learning system, of course, more sensible. Right? So in order to do that, I think one challenge is that uh, it's a heterogeneous AI machine learning resource allocation. Right? This is a more challenging problem than the traditional, uh, for example, in the old days, we only focus on CPU. And later, 
They say, okay, memory I/O can also become a bottleneck. Then we have the multi-resource allocation. But now the resources are, can even be interchangeable. For example, CPU, GPU, TPU, uh, FPGA, different kinds of accelerators can all be used to do the machine learning job, some machine learning job, based on configuration. Right? So the resource allocation problem actually become more challenging and the traditional method is no longer optimal in this case. So we need a new theory and uh, algorithm along this line. Another one is uh, distributed machine learning, right? So to, because when the model, the model will keep growing, but the memory size within the accelerators is, it's very hard for them to keep up with the, the size of the uh, machine learning deep, especially deep learning models. Right? The, therefore, we have a, a motivation to distribute a different part of the machine learning model onto uh, more than one accelerators. But as you can imagine, this is a non-trivial work, right? So it can be easily a uh, NP-hard or APX-hard problem to do it optimally, right? But in practice, as uh, uh, Dr. Ho mentioned in this morning's uh, mm -hmm. uh, keynote talk, right? so we, we cannot wait for a long time, right? So we need to make the decision in a timely manner. Right? So the distributed machine learning is one area uh, I'm working with my students to push it forward. And also with my collaborator, uh, Professor Anshu Gandhi, which is also well known in this community. Another one is uh, the reliability issue, right? So if we do the dynamic reliability, then we can have a, a lot of, uh, uh, save a lot of uh, costs and the cost can transfer to energy consumption. The other direction for future is uh, use them for sensibility. Here, why is we are working with uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory to do the resilient online control, right? to incorporate resilience into the power grid when they're doing control. This is also partially motivated by the recent news in Texas. Right? You heard about the, the, the decision there was not a very robust. Right? So uh, it's a, the, actually people, I, I, I have some friends here, right? During that period, it's a miracle. I think those are avoidable if we can make our uh, online control uh, method more resilient. And um, we also, for AI machine learning for sensibility, we also have a, a very, I think it's a very interesting project with the NAPA, the New York Power Authority. So basically there is with the hydropower. As we said previously, hydropower is still uh, probably largest component in renewable generation and it's also increasing fast, right? But the hydropower for the northern part has a problem that is the icing. Right? If they're icing, it will have a, a huge impact on the power generation. So if we can predict the uh, icing uh, using the advanced AI machine learning method, right? that is our goal in this project. Right? So we can, this is a one uh, recent project uh, we are doing for AI, use AI for the sensibility for the whole power system. Okay, so uh, last part, I want to thank, take this opportunity to thank my collaborators. Uh, so yeah, I really enjoy working with all of them uh, during the past years. I look forward to continue working with them and uh, also work with maybe someone in the audience in the future. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you, Zhenghua. <coughs> um, so, so far, I don't see any question from the chat. So I wonder any of the audience have uh, any questions? Please raise your hand. Checking so far. <clears throat> Anyone have uh, any questions? So, oh, okay, I, I thought, Anshu, you have the question, feel free. I think we can, let me see whether. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Hi, Zenua. Uh, so the, the whole machine learning workloads that we are seeing nowadays, 
I, I wonder what specific opportunities they provide for, uh, you know, for, for let's say more efficient scheduling. There's definitely some flexibility in that, uh, you know, these run for many hours. So, you know, there is some flexibility to move them around, but are there other uh, unique features in these workloads that can help with, uh, you know, scheduling opportunities or resource management opportunities, you think? Yes. So yeah, this is a great question. So uh, let me try to explain in several directions. Uh, one direction is uh, from the time, right? As you just uh, you also mentioned. Uh, okay. So for the time part, uh, there are quite some machine learning job, especially the training. Right? Those are uh, have a flexibility in time, and uh, those training jobs, uh, some of them are very large. So there are definitely flexibility there. Another one is uh, the placement. So uh, in our preliminary study, we saw that if you just uh, uh, use some traditional method to place the workload, uh, the machine learning jobs in the system, uh, then it can far from the can be far from the optimal placement, and uh, the suboptimal placement will result in uh, the a higher energy consumption and it all, it's kind of a waste. So that part is also the, uh, because it's a complicated uh, problem, then there is a room to optimize using algorithm design, scheduling and resource management. Another one is a spatial wise. Right? So uh, for example, Google also has a, uh, the that the, for the TensorFlow uh, to run on mobile devices, and uh, I think it's a TensorFlow Lite, and also the uh, uh, the other one is uh, uh, the federated machine learning, right? federated learning. So all those systems are trying to do the distributed machine learning, and in that one, so there are a lot of opportunities to optimize the current system to improve the overall uh, sustainability and energy consumption. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? So if not, um, so I have a kind of uh, related question, right? So here you actually focus mostly on the tradition of what I call traditional data center network. There's basically a few kind of for large, huge data center network. I, uh, I, I think data centers, I understand that those data centers, the one that, that actually consume a lot of energy, in fact, actually it's, Many of these locations are chosen in places where, for example, there is a relatively cheap uh, uh, electricity and a number of uh, uh, service provider, as you already mentioned, actually uh, kind of actively using solar power and other for, for powering. Right? So now, as the, especially with the rise of IT, there's a lot of more talk about cloud computing. I mean, the edge cloud edge clouds, uh, how would you, I mean, what do you think of some of the solution you have looked at might be applicable when we actually talk, talk about edge cloud, which is gonna be much more diffused, right? So the workload might not be as easy to, as flexible, for example, part of the reason we do edge cloud, uh, edge computing is because you need a kind of real time or at least a semi real time um, kind of responses. Low yeah. latency, you know, right? So can you actually share some lights and any thoughts on this? Yeah, so yeah, thanks. This is an excellent question. So actually we are doing some work uh, along this line. So uh, in last year, how uh, in our Infocom paper, that is uh, handling the placement of uh, uh, service function chains uh, in edge computing. Uh, or you can consider it's uh, not only edge because many edge is also kind of a 
work together with the cloud. And so it's a hybrid system. So there, our goal is to try to minimize the backup cost. Those costs, of course, again, can transform into the energy consumption. The reason is that the edge uh, devices, they are not as reliable as the, those in the cloud uh, environment, right? Therefore, if we just use the simple duplication, for example, duplicate three or four times for each of the service or the storage. So this is a, a may not be the optimal solution. Instead, we propose a dynamic uh, backup scheme to uh, achieve the same level of uh, reliability, uh, but we reduce the cost significantly. Another opportunity I think is uh, in catching. Uh, like in the, the edge catching is that we try to reduce the amount of uh, uh, requests back to the, uh, for example, the base station or even go back to the cloud in the edge environment. Uh, here, if we can do the uh, edge catching very efficiently using some uh, smart algorithm design, then that can uh, help with the uh, energy consumption and the cost because it will reduce the energy consumed to go back to request from a larger uh, base station and also reduce the amount of uh, storage space needed in the edge. Uh, of course, when we move forward, when we move into the 5G network, so we will have a lot of uh, small base station in the system that will further create the opportunity uh, for the small base station to collaborate uh, in order to serve the user workload more efficiently so we can further reduce the uh, energy consumption and the cost. I Great. hope that answers your question. <laughs> Great. So I wonder, anyone else have any question? I don't know. <coughs> Uh, how much time I have. Maybe I can just use timing for one more question. And um, so uh, listen to your talk about a lot of your work actually work closely with uh, say industry. Mm -hmm. So kind of for the benefit and interest of some of the junior, uh, I, I know you are still junior assistant professor, but other for, for graduate student and some of the uh, more recent PhD, uh, young faculty, for example, right? So in order for them to do, for example, similar type of research, can you share some kind of insight you have? I mean, how do you actually engage with industry, right? You have certain solutions, certain model, how do you actually convince them, hey, I have a good idea you should adopt, right? Okay, yeah, this is a long story. But I will try to share some thoughts. Uh, uh, of course, if you are a graduate student, uh, you know, the support from your advisor is very important. From that perspective, I'm very lucky uh, because both Adam and Stephen, they are very supportive. Uh, I, even for one summer, I even did a back-to-back -back internship at both Google and the HP lab. Uh, so it's very important, very beneficial for me. Uh, in particular, for example, the geographic load balancing work. So I did the, uh, the work before I did the internship with Google. So that, uh, the, the team I work with is actually who uh, write the storage system. And from there, I can learn more about the system details. I also get a chance to look at the, for example, the, the code doing the global workload management. So this gives me a lot of confidence that this is uh, on the right direction. And with HP, I, I, I interned with them uh, for three summers and also during even normal semester, we are doing it in a Python manner. So uh, it's, it's really uh, beneficial because uh, you can know how, because they are uh, industry research lab. So they sit between academia and the Pew, uh, the development and the production team. Right? So they can also appreciate the work we did in academia and they also know the need from the, the real production team. So I think that one really helped me a lot. 
as a student. So later as a faculty member, I think it's, a, it's a, again very beneficial. Uh, and it's probably a little bit easier, right? Because now uh, you have more control of your, uh, whether you want to collaborate with industry. Of course, uh, the challenge is uh, the time commitment, but uh, I think I benefit a lot. It's, for example, with IBM folks, we have a weekly meeting and uh, push the project forward. Uh, I think the key here is to find the right team who can really appreciate your work. Uh, for example, the IBM uh, folks, they work on a topic that is exactly along the line I did uh, several years ago. So and I also have my student to working along that direction. So it's also very good for the student to participate into uh, this research. And uh, because the, I think it, because it's a very much time of topic. So the people from IBM are also very supportive. So that's how I got the IBM faculty award. Right? Because the, I think the, the mutual match here, I think is very important. But I, I definitely encourage uh, all of you to uh, to talk to industry people, and I think that uh, as long as we keep open minded, and uh, I think they need us, right, industry people. Uh, and uh, it's just the challenge I I do in the past years is that uh, at the especially at the beginning, we may not be on the same page in terms of the level of abstraction of the problem. So they may be very detail oriented because they actually work on the system. But for us, we, we need to do the model always design, we do the, even the proof, right? So we need the model to be uh, trackable, right? But uh, at the same time, we need to ignore some of the details. So I think the beginning, uh, we need some effort so that we are on the same page. But as long as we keep pushing, right? As, as I mentioned, if, as long as we are working on the have the same interest for the research problem or the, for the real system problem. So I think all those challenges, they are just transitional, right? So once we go over the first stage, then you already know each other and get used to each other's language. And then it's very smooth. And uh, once you set one collaboration, that collaboration can stay there for uh, several years right? or even longer. So those are very, Reward. Great. And uh, <coughs> wonder any audience have any questions? Uh, so it seems like we may have uh, time for some break, right? So 10 to 15 minutes break before we move on to the next session. Thank you all. <coughs> uh, I know we can't really uh, give a, a, a loud applause for, for Zhenghua's talk. So I would kind of, kind of on behalf of the audience give you applause. Yeah, thank you, thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I know some people need to watch the video later because due to the time zone issue, I'm more than happy to answer any question. Yep. And I guess I'm gonna hand off to whoever is the chair of the next session. Thank you again. Yeah. I have to drop off and